but that's your reference points, what they're based on. Kelvin has, I guess, preference in the things most of those we do because it has a more meaningful reference point. And it's really only got one reference point. Zero Kelvin is defined as absolute zero. And we talked briefly about that on the first day. Remember what absolute zero was? Temperature it takes to make molecular motion stop. So you cool things down, they move less and less, you eventually get to the point where they stop moving entirely. That's defined as zero Kelvin. And you can't have negative numbers on the Kelvin scale. That's why it's called absolute zero. There's no going beyond zero because you can't have less motion <coughs> than zero motion, correct? Therefore, absolute zero is the defining point. There are no negative numbers on that scale. Now, giving you some um, landmark numbers, I guess you would call them. Boiling point and freezing point of water on each of these three scales. <coughs> Celsius here should be the easy one because that's your definitions. Boiling point of water, freezing point of water are 100 and 0 by definition. Fahrenheit though, freezing is 32, boiling is 212. Kelvin, freezing is 273.15 and boiling is 373.15. Which if you compare boiling and freezing on the Kelvin scale from 273.15 to 373.15 is exactly 100 units, correct? not coincidence because the Kelvin scale is really just a modification of the Celsius scale. They took the Celsius scale and redefined zero and that's it. But the size of the unit stayed the same. So it's not a coincidence that it's exactly 100 units from freezing to boiling just like Celsius was. <clears throat> and the nice thing about that is it gives you a very simple conversion between the two units. If you're trying to convert Celsius into Kelvin, the Kelvin temperature is equal to the Celsius temperature plus 273.15. All you got to do is add that difference. Or conversely, if you're trying to convert Kelvin to Celsius, Celsius would be Kelvin minus 273.15. Just an addition or subtraction conversion because fundamentally <coughs> they're the same scale. Fahrenheit conversions aren't quite so straightforward. Celsius to Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit would be equal to 1.8 times the Celsius temperature, <coughs> then add 32. convert in and out of these units. Okay. 
So these conversions you need to memorize. And notice there's not any equations up here that convert Fahrenheit and Kelvin. If you're trying to convert from Fahrenheit to Kelvin, then go from Fahrenheit to Celsius, and then Celsius to Kelvin. So that cuts down on a couple of equations that you don't need to memorize. Just by following through doing your units. Work problem 11 on your own. You've got 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. What is that in Celsius? What is that in Kelvin? Thirty-two and the one point eight are considered constants, and those do not figure in as far as significant figures go. So, if that's three significant figures going in, then when the calculator says thirty-seven degrees, we make it point zero or three significant figures. Your answer should be 37.0. Question? And then when you convert that Celsius to Kelvin, it's strictly an addition thing. So I'm going to set it out like this. cannot keep the second decimal place unless you come out to 310.2 Question about the conversions or why the significant figures are the way they are. Make sure you memorize these four conversion equations. The next thing in the study pack is chapter two stuff, so let's skip over that for the moment. Turn to the, toward the back on the part about specific heat. We're going to do the specific heat section and then we'll move back forward. Things are set up here to give you two definitions for this, kind of, a, I guess, a formal and an informal definition. Formal definition for specific heat is the amount of heat needed to raise one gram of a substance by 
1 degree Celsius. However much heat it takes to raise the temperature of one gram of the material by one degree Celsius. So by definition, you're talking about one gram of the material, raising it one degree, how much energy, how much heat is that going to take? And every substance has a different structure, so everything handles heat in different ways, and no two things are going to have the same specific heat pattern. So as an example, the example you've got in the notes here. Comparing iron and aluminum. <clears throat> These are both starting out at the same temperature. You've got exactly one gram of the we're going to put in heat and make the temperature rise. Now, the specific heat of iron is 0 0.45 joules. Capital J is the unit for joules. That's your unit of energy. 0 0.45 joules per gram per degree Celsius. That's a constant. That's not, a, that's not something you want to remember. Specific heat values would always be kept. But just for comparison, that's what it is. For aluminum, it has a specific heat of 0 0.90 joules per gram degree Celsius. So there's our samples. We're going to heat them both, and just to keep the numbers simple, let's say we pump in the 0 0.90 joules, exactly 0 0.90 joules into both of them. What's that amount of heat going to do to this aluminum? That's exactly enough to take it up by one degree, correct? So what's the temperature going to wind up? 26. 26. What about that same 0 0.90 over here? That's twice what it needs, correct? So we're going to wind up. 27. Compare that. Which material has the higher specific heat value? Aluminum. And which one gave you the most temperature change? Iron. And so that's what leads us to this other, more informal, Definition of specific heat. Resistance to temperature change. Things with high specific heats tend to hold their temperature well in spite of gaining a significant amount of energy or even losing a significant amount of energy. For whatever reason, the specific heat of aluminum is twice what iron is. And so for a given amount of heat, you see half the change, correct? Question about the, either of these definitions. Right. About the highest specific heat you are ever going to see is this for water. If we compare this to iron, 4.184 compared to 0.45, this is roughly nine times higher. So for the amount of heat that would change iron by nine degrees, it would change water by one. I mean, I know four does not usually sound like a high number, but in specific heat contexts, so that's a high number. There's not anything common that has a higher specific heat than that. 
So that means water tends to hold its temperature well. Go ahead. Can you explain one more time why you test five? Why aluminum has why it has the higher specific heat? I don't know why. Um, that's just an experimentally measured constant. Uh, specific heat values would always be given to you. All right. So, but you would need to be able to use those specific heats to do calculations like we're about to do, or comparisons like what we were just talking about here. All right. It has a lot to do with the crystal structure and how they're attached to each other. Um, but getting into the specific crystal structures of those two, I really don't remember. And that's deeper than we would want to go anyway. Question about the path. <coughs> right. Water holds its temperature really, really well. It can gain a lot of heat and barely change temperature, or it can lose a lot of heat and barely change temperature. Which is why your body can maintain its temperature so well. Your body's 90% water. So in spite of exertion or extremes of heat and cold, your body does pretty well of holding its temperature. And it has a lot to do with that specific heat. All right. Applying it then, you have this equation. Heat, the, the actual amount of heat involved in the process is equal to the specific heat of the material times the mass of the sample that you're working with times the change in temperature that you see and measure. The little delta here just meaning change. Units, heat is going to be in units of joules. Specific heat is joules per gram degree C, which means that mass has got to be in gram units and that your temperature change has got to be in Celsius units for unit cancellation reasons. So even though this is somewhat of a set formula, what we talked about with dimensional analysis and canceling out units still applies. If you were given the mass of something as being three and a half pounds, you'd have to convert that to grams or your units ain't gonna work. All right, unit conversion still matters. But this allows you to calculate for that material what it is and how much you have and what temperature change you see going on. You can calculate the heat, how much heat it's absorbing or releasing. So as a first problem, number 17. <coughs> Go ahead and work that one on your own with this being the specific key to mind. Calculator will say 15 
175 joules. But you would have to round that off to two significant figures because of your temperature change. So you should be getting specific heat of iron 0.45, 50 grams of it, and a temperature change of 70 degrees. Going from 25 to 95 is a 70 degree change. So you plug that in, you calculate this, you think about significant figures, and you round it to this. Question about the 1575 or the 1600. 1600. <coughs> because you can only keep two significant figures and you're between 1500 and 1600. You'd have to round it to the hundreds place. So that would round up. Question about this equation. It's pretty much a four variable equation. You're going to know three of the four. You're solving for the four. Number 18. zero grams of water it's at 39.5 degrees initially absorbs 2.35 kilojoules of heat what the temperature is going to become. Apparently, since it's absorbing heat, it's going to become something higher than 39.5, right? If it's absorbing heat, temperature goes up. We want to calculate exactly what that's going to wind up at. And here's our equation. So we're calculating toward that change in temperature. Specific heat of water is a constant. Mass of water is 35.0 grams. say 2.35. Change it to joules, because that's kilojoules. That's not the right unit for what we're working. And that kilo prefix means a thousand. One kilojoule is a thousand joules. So this is 2,350 joules. Once you do the conversion, 2,350 joules. Then we solve toward the temperature change. So 2,350 divided by 4.184 divided again by 35. This is a temperature change of 16.0 degrees Celsius. Now we're not done yet, but are you okay getting that change? What did you divide? I'm so sorry. Uh, it was the 2,350 divided by both of these. Just rearranging the algebra. That's a temperature change of 16 degrees because it's absorbing heat. It's getting 16 degrees hotter than it was initially. So the final temperature would be 
16.0 degrees higher than its star height. That equation up there is just going to tell you what the change is. So that 16 that you solve out for is the temperature change, not the actual temperature it winds up at. And the way we know that the temperature winds up higher than it started is the where it absorbs. If it's absorbing heat, the temperature goes up. Question about this one? If there is, please ask. Do the next one on your own. 19. Are you getting what you're supposed to? Go ahead. Where do I get the specific heat, like out of here? Like oh. everything else in it, does it don't know? It's still water, and so it's still the 4.184 like in the previous. not a constant that you need to remember, but if you do the practice problems and stuff, you probably will memorize it just from sheer repetition. But those kinds of values would always be given. But like on the exam, if I gave you this problem on the exam, that value would not be given in the problem itself. It would be at the back on the reference page. And so you'd have to realize I need the specific heat of water, and you flip back there and you find it. Go ahead. Question? When is the first degree? I'm sorry. When's the first degree? A week from today, maybe? Does anybody have the calendar with you? I think it's a week from today. No, that's Labor Day. Yeah, we got you. So it would be a week from Wednesday. But either way, it's we've got one more day of material, which is Wednesday. So today's material and Wednesday's material, and that's the cutoff for the material for the exam. So the, on our test, you're talking about the, um, the stuff you would give us. Will you give us, like, when we're converting, will you give us certain things? I would give you any conversions that you needed except those metric prefixes. So I would tell you how to convert from pounds to grams, but I wouldn't tell you how to convert from grams to milligrams or something like that. 
Other questions? I don't think we have a calendar. The calendar is on um, online on B2L. You can print it from there. Okay, other question about this problem, number 19. There's only one word different between 18 and 19, right? And what difference does that one word make? Subtract instead of add. Direction of flow, correct? If it's releasing heat, then it's going to go down in temperature. And when you set this one up, as far as your specific heat formula goes, it's going to look identical. As far as your actual specific heat formula goes, there's nothing different. It's still going to calculate out a 16.0 degrees change like it did in the previous problem. The difference is what you do with that 16. Since it's releasing heat, it's lowering temperature, it winds up at a lower temperature. Question. Now that's, I guess, the first step, the first introduction to your specific heat formula, where you're treating the heat as a known quantity. Most of the time, experiments aren't like that, where you're just pumping in heat. Most of the time, that heat comes from another substance. And so you've got to track heat flow back between two different materials, one losing, one gaining. And so the next page is about heat flow between two substances. And it's a variation of what we just did. At the top of the page you're given is for substance A and substance B. The heat involved for one substance would be calculated by specific heat times mass times change in temperature, and the other material would go by like formula. But since the heat lost by one is the same as the heat gained by the other, then by substituting equations, Which is identical to your normal specific heat equation, except instead of setting this equation equal to the actual number of joules, you're setting it equal to the same equation for the other material. But for each substance, it's specific heat times mass times change in temperature. So this big equation.